Well, hi again, everybody, and welcome to another new edition of Inside Furman Athletics. I am the voice of the Paladins, Dan Scott. Good to be with you. We would have been here last week, but we had that uh, occasional freak snowstorm that we get in the south, so everybody was off campus. But we're back, and we feel like we've got a good one for you today. I say that all the time. I am ever the optimist. Every time we put something out, I believe it's going to be good, and it's usually because of the quality of the guests that we bring in. No pressure. <laughs> Our uh, guest on this edition of Inside Furman Athletics is the uh, new offensive coordinator here at Furman, Justin Roper, who uh, joined Clay Hendricks' staff. I, I guess officially it's been, what, about two weeks, something like that? Yeah, this is my second week. So I uh, kind of came in right when the snow was about to happen. So Brought the, it with you from Massachusetts. That's right? the joke on staff. Right. I told I apologized, but it didn't have any effect on the weather. So glad to get that thing, uh, everything melted off and get rolling this morning. So you, you got here. It was just kind of business as usual as far as that was concerned, right? I, Everybody else in the south is freaking out. and you're. I know. Up there we were like, we can still play golf. So... <clears throat> but it, no, it's it was it's always weird because I'm from this area, you know, from across the state line in Georgia. But uh, it's it's not that you can't drive in the snow; it's who around you may not be able to drive in the snow. <laughs> well, n no offense, I, I grew up in West Virginia, and and I learned to drive in my dad's '78 station wagon, which had its own challenges. Okay, <laughs> right. so I, I have always considered myself to be a very good bad weather driver. One of the keys to being a good bad weather driver is knowing when not to drive. In bad weather. Avoid the problems. Yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> so that that's uh, another story for another time. Have you been here long enough to get a grip on anything yet? I won't even say everything. I mean, on anything yet. Um, getting a feel for the people. That's always the first thing that you do when you when you come into a new, uh, new uh, opportunity and situation and team. So uh, just starting to be around the guys, the players, and around the coaching staff and just trying to you know, get the right conversations going with what we want to do and, and who we want to become, uh, at least from an offensive standpoint. And just one of the things that I'm excited about is just the how many players are just coming up to the office and just spending time hanging around. So mm -hmm. I'm very kind of open with guys being in the room while we're just talking through what we want to do offensively. And, and that's kind of the type of setting that we're s starting off with. So that's that's what I'm getting started with before we do any kind of, um, you know, I really haven't been here with any recruiting visits or anything that, you know, anything practice wise. So we just started our first mat drill this morning. So I got a little bit of a feel for, you know, some of the work ethic and, you know, how much the, the coach Bernardi, the strength coach pushes the guys. So I'm dipping my toes in there. Number one, players just love mat drills. And number two, Bernardi will push coaches as well as he will athletes if you're not careful. So. Oh, I've heard. <laughs> I've heard. He's he's notorious for, hey, 4 a.m. workout coaches. Uh, so he'll pop some stuff on you every now and then there too. Uh, Andre is one of those guys that I like to say makes coffee nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, he, he doesn't have an off switch. He, no. It's like I used to say about my youngest daughter when she was little, she had two gears, overdrive and sleep, and there was nothing in between, and that's kind of what – Andre Bernardi uh, is like when, when you I don't know if you've had a chance to meet with the team as a whole yet but as you meet with these individual players or if it was in a group setting you have to get to know them but they have to get to know you so what are you telling them about yourself whether it's personal philosophy how are you introducing Justin Roper to this team uh, I got the chance to do that uh, I think last Friday morning they had kind of a morning run uh, right after the snow kind of got out of here. And um, that was when Coach Hendricks introduced me to the full team. I haven't said anything to the full team. He just kind of introduced who I was. and uh, But I got a chance to speak to the whole offense, which was which was good the first time. I always I would just kind of talk about what they can expect. Um, because if you set kind of what an expectation is just for what I'm going to behave like and then you follow up with that, then mm -hmm. there's automatically trust built. Uh, so I just said that, you know, um, I'm excited to be here. I'm from a lot uh, – really close to this area, and it's good to be back kind of closer to home and really can expect there will be some changes. We're going to try to keep some things that really worked. We're going to try to do some other things that maybe will help us, uh, try to be a little bit more explosive offensively and, and uh, try to score as many points as we can. <laughs> so That's usually the end goal, isn't that's, it? That's what I'm here for, score points. So – 
Yeah. You're also here not only as the offensive coordinator, but specifically – if, if you even narrow it down further to work with quarterbacks. And, and, and the quarterback play here ha, has been an issue. I don't think we're telling any state secrets over the last couple of years because of, of some things that happened that were, in, in effect, out of the control of the coaching staff. You, you've got a really bright, young, talented young man in Jace Wilson. You, you've got a transfer coming in. You've got another highly regarded recruit coming in. But But it's going to be – a quarterback room that that has varying levels of experience here, working with a new quarterback coach and offensive coordinator. So that that, that always, from the outside anyway, can appear to be a little dicey yep. when you're talking about trying to to develop quarterbacks and develop an offensive philosophy. Yeah, I think the easiest the easiest argument people will make is, well, it's a new guy and and there's a uh, young quarterbacks that that's a negative thing. And I I actually look I look at it as a positive because I get to actually create who they are a little mm-hmm. bit. So one of the harder ones is you come into a situation when you have a senior who's been coached for four years or whatever up until that point. Right. So there's a whole other realm of well he thinks he already knows how to play the position. And so you have to kind of break old habits and form new ones when they're older. That's a lot harder, I think. Um, and you get some experience under their belt. But I, I actually like taking uh, the opportunities of coaching new and young players because, you know, from my standpoint, they don't know anything yet, right. which is great. I get to t- I get to tell them what I think is important for them to know, mm-hmm. you know, from my perspective. So I'm excited, and I think um, you know we'll figure out what they're good at. And that's the first thing is I only want to do what they're able to do. The the other little nuance to this is that in, in the release about the uh, new offensive line coach uh, here that was put out just uh, just a couple of days ago and talking about Matt McCutcheon, who is coming from East Tennessee State University, at the end of that release, just kind of a, a little, little note that Brian Bratton, who's a Hall of Famer here at Furman, uh, wide receivers coach, ha- has been named co-offensive coordinator. So how's that dynamic going to work out? Mm-hmm. It's it's great. Um, it was in, it's obviously important that we have a guy that's been here, has a long history with Furman mm-hmm. with a lot of success, to have a leadership role as well. It's mm-hmm. important. Um, so, and I'm a, I'm a guy that I want to open up discussions on the table and have input from people because you never know what people are going to bring to the table from a you know from a knowledge standpoint, from an idea standpoint. And um, all the ide- first thing I told him, I was like, I don't want all the ideas to come from me. Uh, for <laughs> so it's it's a it's a positive thing. And the offensive staff room that I've you know kind of been been in for about week and a half now, two weeks. <laughs> uh, there's no egos, you know. Um, so that makes it a thousand times easier to kind of go about things. And everyone wants to win and score as many as we can. Um, and then with Coach McCutcheon coming in, you got you're bringing you know, someone in who knows the conference, who's won a lot of games in conference and made a long playoff run. Uh, and so you, he knows the roadmap to get to that point uh, in from this conference, which right. is really, really important. And uh, so it's only a, a positive addition to the, to the, to the group of, of coaches we have. So Justin Roper, the new offensive coordinator here at Furman, our guest on this week's edition of Inside Furman Athletics. So let's – Get down to where the rubber meets the road. What's your offensive philosophy, and how does that mesh with what Clay Hendricks expects out of his offense? Yeah, so uh, Coach Hendricks did a, a, a lot of <laughs> – when he was going through the process of finding his, a coordinator and hiring, uh, he did a lot of homework on his end to try to find the right fit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he already kind of had a really good idea of what he wanted before he even – when he reached out to me. And there was a lot of – there was a lot of mesh – uh, meshing up that worked. It, it, there was a lot of similarities from how we approach the game. Uh, the f- identity that I start with with our guys is execution. The first thing that we're going to be identified with is execution. And that is a uh, – that's a mentality where it doesn't matter what the situation is, doesn't matter if you're up or down. You just focus on the current play at the time, execute the current play. So – you kind of take a little bit of the emotional up and down waves that can happen in a game and you remove that from how you actually perform mm-hmm. and it shouldn't matter. Right. Uh, so, and it allows you to focus on those things during practice. So that's always the first thing that I start with. And that, uh, that is 
regardless of system, play call, scheme, none of that matters. So, and then from a, what the offense will look like, I have an interesting background from high school where I played at Buford High School, which is a under center, power eye, power running, physical team, smash mouth type of mentality. Mm-hmm. But I played in Oregon's spread offense under Chip Kelly. So we have that type of explosiveness with, you know, uh, kind of a wide open run and pass blend of attack. Right. So I have a kind of a blend of the couple things there that um, that really kind of has what I believe in uh, offensively. And then we're going to blend kind of what has been really successful in the past here the last year or so um, and then kind of use what our personnel is good at doing. So, you know. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a morph, I think, over time. Old football coach once told me that oftentimes, and maybe, maybe most times, it doesn't come down to the X's and O's. It comes down to the Jimmy's and the Joe's. That's you talk correct. about personnel, right? That's correct. It's the first thing we did when we when we got here was, uh, as an offensive staff, I said, all right, I don't even care about like play playbooks and sheets. I was like, talk to me about who is on the team right now. Because mm-hmm. if we want to run whatever system and – but we don't have the guys that are going to fit in those particular spots. It doesn't matter. It's not going to work. Right. So that's the first thing that I needed to figure out and understand and kind of where some little shifts we can make. Uh, you know, I'm more of the 11 personnel spread type of team, but I'd like to be multiple to fit your personnel and who the, who you have on the field. You know, and, and I can't help it any time I hear a football coach talk about execution. I go back – and this is a victim of age plus the fact that I love NFL films with the old John McKay thing with the Tampa yep. Bay Bucks. You know where I'm talking about, right? Oh, yeah. where they ask him, I think it was in their first year, what he thought about his the offense's execution, and he said he was for it. So, <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a good idea. Yeah, that that's not exactly where we're going with this, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to be making I'm not. I don't know if we'll be doing student body right either. So <laughs> That's good stuff. Um, h- how long – Will it take you to get a grip on your personnel? Um, spring. Spring's a good good indicator. Again, you're not going to know everything that they can do until you actually see stuff in game day. So, mm-hmm. but spring, first week and a half of spring, I'll get a I'll get a pretty good idea of all right. This guy can be is a playmaker. You know who are these guys are kind of um, good in a certain role who's ready for a certain number of reps because you get to a lot of those type of situations where you know you have two to three really reliable playmakers that mm-hmm. you need to work to get the ball um, or the offensive line is really good at these couple schemes but we need to limit how much they do this right, right. so there's a little give and take on that and it's really more of it's there's a blunt balance of giving them enough things to work on and fail at a little bit in spring mm-hmm. without overloading them. So you can kind of see what we're not going to be good at and maybe isn't our thing this year. Uh, so there's a, it's kind of a chemistry set a little bit in the spring and kind of figuring out what we can do. You go into mad scientist mode? A little. You know, you, you, you give them a little bit more than they're going to be capable of handling to a degree and then we'll see if the, how much they're able to pick up naturally and then see where you can kind of push or add or where you need to back off. So. Have you had – again, you're, you're in your second week, so you've not had an incredible amount of time, but have you been able to start watching film on, on, uh, on your guys? I watched film – I've watched about half the season before I got down here. Um, I got a – with, you know, the uh, te- no, no, technology advancement mm-hmm. with football, you can – I had all the film available for me when they put me uh, into the system that I could watch and watched kind of the season backwards. Mm-hmm. actually started with the most recent game and started watching backwards towards the season to kind of see what it lo- product looked like now and then over time going backwards. So I kind of watched g- some good, you know, and a lot of conference games, which is what I was more interested in. Right. I didn't watch us against NC State or, you know, um, anything like that. So I watched a lot of the conference games that are big games down the stretch that, you know, those are the ones you need to win to get somewhere you want to go and – what it kind of looked like, some good, some bad, where where I can fit, you know. Mm-hmm. So since you're wearing a headset, I'll I'll put you in the role of analyst as you as you watched your offense. What did you see when it came to execution, production? What what did what did you like, and what what needs to be worked on? Yeah, it's it's uh it's interesting. I think that 
obviously the strength of the team coming from the triple offense with Coach Chronic a few years ago and kind of blending with Coach Corals is obviously the running back position with just a lot of coming out of that type of system. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then some of the stretch uh, stretch zone that was done up front. Um, there's a lot of big play potential and versatility in that room and a lot of guys that have had carries. So there's obviously a huge benefit in that room that we can – we don't have to now all of a sudden just throw the ball around all the time to think that that's the way to win. Um, and then you have some young talent at quarterback. You have some you have some versatility at tight end, you know, and there's some, there's some guys that are making plays. I think what I saw was there's a, there's some potential. And then my, my job will be to direct it the right way mm-hmm. rather than trying to just create offense all the time. So it's like, can I get this person in this spot who's going to be able to win this matchup? You, know, you, you talked about playing at Oregon's where you started your college career. You, you then transferred to Montana, and, and you got a chance to play for an FCS championship while you were there. So you've been to the game mm-hmm. that this program expects to get to, hasn't been to for a long yep. time. But but you've been there. Uh, some years ago, the kids used to call that street cred. I don't know if that's still <laughs> a, fra- a phrase or not. But you bring that credibility. You you've been to where this program wants to go. Does that help you in that locker room? Uh, it can't hurt. So I mean, it, it just gives you um, experience to draw on uh, when you're talking about what it took to get there. Um, so. The fact that you know I was on a team that made the run. Um, now you say went to we didn't win, so that's, uh, that, that's why I phrased so it I kinda, that way. <laughs> you you went to the game, that... so I keep the chip on my shoulder right. a little bit. So, uh, in matter of fact, our last our last game in the playoffs this past year when I was at Holy Cross was against Villanova, same mm-hmm. team. So, I uh, still have a little bone to pick with them personally, but uh, it does help you when you, you know you know where your athletic director came from, right? I know I talked to him when I came down here and interviewed, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we had that moment. But uh, he rubbed in my face a little bit. I'm sure he did. But I'm probably the only guy that's a little taller than him too. So yeah. we have. But uh, I think it helps you with the players. I think the the fact that I have been there gives you credence to some of the things that you're going to say that this is what it takes. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of the thing that stuck out to me when I was on that team was just the guys didn't – they didn't overreact to things that were outside their control. They just executed into their job, right. which is where the identity comes from. So what kind of player were you? Uh, <laughs> not as good as I thought I probably should have been, I would say that. So uh, I was a good enough player to be on some really good teams and make enough plays to, for people to remember some games. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like I was a bridge between two great Oregon quarterbacks – uh, with Dennis Dixon, Jeremiah Masoli, and then into Darren Thomas. So that was a good little few-game bridge between two really good guys. But I was around – I was good enough to be around a lot of talent around me and a lot of players that did different things well and good coaches as well to learn from. i got to ask you this. It's been 30 years now, which it's still hard for me to even say that phrase. But uh, – I had a, a, a chance as a sports writer to cover the Arena League down in Orlando. You had a chance to – I love <laughs> arena football, uh, the the 50-yard indoor war, That's they call it. What was that experience like for you? It's like an arcade game. It's It feels like an arcade game, a video game. It's 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 weirdly not football. It's it's But it's, like, exciting. Um, every play could be a touchdown. Mm-hmm. It was odd. You know, every play was designed to be a touchdown almost because you almost never ran the ball. Um, you have the guy that's in motion when he hits, you know, going forward when you snap the ball. Timing that up took me a while. It was it was really weird, but I did tur- I did take a couple little you know coaching points from it just on how to pass the ball with that type of it's very different type of pass game. You threw to you threw to spots on the field rather than receivers, and the receiver would go to the spot. It was kind of weird. Like we're both getting to this this landmark on a throw in a run a run route so a little different and then there was a burden of you have to score every time you have the ball Mm -hmm. like you have to score a touchdown every time you have the ball because otherwise they're going to so there was a little bit of um a little bit of that pressure 
on the game that was different? I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I remember an interview, this has been years ago, with Kurt Warner, who famously played mm-hmm. there before getting his finally getting his shot with the Rams and, and becoming a Hall of Famer. But he talked about playing in that league helped him with his quick decision-making and getting rid of the ball very quickly, yep. which turned out to be a perfect match for that greatest show on turf team he was on right. with the Rams. Did, did you see that? I did. I, I think that the Arena League does teach that because the field's small. You don't have a lot of – there's not a lot of extra space. And then the defenders are still professional defenders, so they can close space quickly. And with the player hitting this motion on the, on the sprint, he's going to win. So you're, you almost never take a five-step – drop everything's like three steps and your ball's out so the anticipation is the the highest i ever had to play under you know so he's 100 percent right the you have to see things before they're going to happen type of mentality all right so now translate that into your job mm-hmm. now as offensive coordinator and working with these quarterbacks in this room does any of that translate it does i i, I we read defenders uh, from a quarterback standpoint so it, you know, doing that at that type of level with that type of anticipation, you learn how to read like body language of defenders instead of like having route progressions as a lot of people do it. Uh, it just, it's you find any way to give the QB just a little quarter second more uh, anticipation before he the ball is going to be broken up. So that's kind of the, the mentality I learned from it. And then you also learn, you know, there's, this player we have is going to beat that player they have if I can get that matchup. So there's a little bit of creativity to get a mismatch, almost Mm basketball-like, you know, could create switches and different stuff that way that you can take uh, when you start playing different teams at at our, at our level as well. Yeah. It's really amazing. And and for me just to have a small snapshot of what goes on that you can run, one base play out of an offense, but you can disguise it with five or six different formations yep. to try to get the matchups yep. that you want and, and doing it with motion. But at the end, it's the same thing. You're just doing all this eye candy, for lack of yep. a better term, to confuse the defense. Yeah, there, we kind of had the, a little bit of that discussion this this week uh, with the O, the o staff, and there's kind of two different ways, I think, to – you know, at least pass game-wise um, – and a little bit of run game, you can either run the same concept and do different shifts or movements or formational stuff to get to the same concept, or you can kind of line up in a similar offensive set Mm -hmm. multiple times and run complementary plays. So there's two different ways to go about it. I've done both. Um, You know, I think at at Holy Cross, we're a little bit more um, line up in this set we're going to run these co- couple plays. We're looking for this guy to do this for us to do this play, like kind of complement based on what they want to do reaction-wise. So there's a little bit of give and take on that depending on you know, what we're good at doing and who we have. So if we have a huge difference maker of a playmaker, um, let's say at receiver, okay, well, we may need to scheme up a way for him to get a matchup to just give him a chance. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of ways to go about it. This is this is one time it's been really good to be a lifelong Cincinnati Bengals fan, which, which I am. But but watching what they've done with Jamar Chase, uh, the, the just incredible wide receiver out of LSU, you know he he he's a, he's an outside guy, but they're not afraid to put him in the slot yep. to to move him in, in different places. So yep. I guess from your standpoint as an offensive coordinator, if you've got a guy like that, you've got to be willing to put him in different places yep. to get matchups that you want. Well, if I have him. There's a lot of we can do. Well, if do. we had Jamar Chase, just run. I'm going to throw it, right? I'll take him. With, yeah, with, we'll figure out. I hand the ball in the backfield. I don't care. So, uh, no, it's – we actually are – when we're going about recruiting, from a recruiting standpoint, we've talked about, well, we like this player because he has the versatility to play inside and outside, mm-hmm. you know, and bring more things to the table than just being pigeonholed into one position. Right. So, Guys that are able to do that flexibility, there's different skill sets. Some guys can't go inside or out. Some guys are stri- you know, strictly outside receivers or slot receivers or running backs or whatever, and that's fine. They have to be really good at what they do. Then you have guys that are bring more to the table from a scheme standpoint. Uh, this player allows us to get into an empty backfield. Mm-hmm. Uh, this player allows us to motion him in to be in the slot, and it's not unnatural for him. 
Uh, so it just again, like it, that's what spring is for to figure out what all those guys can bring to the table, and then you go into camp and kind of figure out how to use them. I wish we could go on uh, because there's a lot more we could discuss about this, and I'm sure our fans are enjoying it. But Justin's got to get to a staff meeting, <laughs> so we're going to have to uh, do ha- my ha- job. I guess ha- have to take a pause <laughs> right here and, and maybe set up for a part two uh, a little bit later on. But uh, thanks for coming up uh, and, and spending some time with us on, on this uh, edition of Inside Furman Athletics. And uh, let's let's do it again soon. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. All right. Yeah, I guess I got to do my job and try to score, I guess. Yeah, but. imagine imagine that. <laughs> Quit talking to the media and go to work. That's <laughs> probably what the, the moral of that story is. This has been this brand new edition of Inside Furman Athletics. Next week, we will be back with Athletic Director Jason Donnelly and another special guest as well as he begins his monthly appearances with us here on the show. We'll look forward to that. Listen, have a great day. Don't forget, we're doing this on Tuesday, Furman Basketball at home on Wednesday night against VMI. That's a huge game inside the Southern Conference, 7 p.m. Bob Ritchie has been imploring students, fans, let's pack out Timmins Arena and make it a great atmosphere. We'll see you again next time. For Justin Roper, I'm Dan Scott saying God bless you and so long, everybody.